Hi, this is Lisa Guida. I'm the Director of Education here at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. Welcome to Nuclear Science Week Virtual. We hope you enjoy this series and we look forward to seeing you in the museum. Hi, this is Mr. Dave with the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. Welcome to Nuclear Science Week 2020. This is our virtual uh, tour of part of our museum uh, because we're gonna be talking about the history of nuclear. Uh, and to be doing that is going to be uh, Jim Walter, our museum director, and Jennifer Hayden, our museum deputy director. Uh, they both know a lot about nuclear and a lot about the history of nuclear. So they're gonna show us a couple things in the museum. Some things I've also included or there are some links to the Atomic Heritage Foundation videos where you can see interviews from Oppenheimer uh, and you can see uh, a lot of neat videos about nuclear including some of the detonations and some of the detonation tests. Uh, some very cool uh, links that you can continue your studies into the history of nuclear. But since they know a lot more than me about the topic, we're going to go ahead and let Jim and Jennifer tell you all about it. The Trinity test was a very difficult time. Here we have the gadget. This is a device that was used to test the Trinity weapon. Now they used it and called it the gadget because they did not want to use the word bomb. There were spies at that time trying to steal the secrets of the United States and use them to their advantage during the war. The gadget, and this is one of the only ones there is, was a device that included high explosive lenses that would implode and crush a piece of plutonium down to criticality level causing an explosion. This is what was tested at Trinity. Another reason that the atomic age is so very relevant to New Mexico, to where the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History is housed here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, would be the Trinity test. So that was the world's very first testing of the atomic bomb, July 16th, 1945. So this is when all of the work and the progress from the Manhattan Project was taken to White Sands, New Mexico. When they hoisted the world's very first atomic bomb up a 100 foot steel tower to see what would happen when it was detonated. So on this 100 foot steel tower, there is a shed at the very top that the bomb went into. And then all of the scientists, the engineers, military people, everyone went about 10 miles away to see exactly what would happen not knowing what would happen to the world with the world's very first atomic bomb. So in our Trinity area, our exhibit at the museum, we have artifacts and objects such as the bomb casings of Fat Man and Little Boy, which were the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki ending World War II. We have limousines, Oppenheimer's limo, that is said to have driven Oppenheimer back and forth between Los Alamos and the Trinity site. J. Robert Oppenheimer decided to test the plutonium bomb, or gadget, in the desert of the Alamogordo bombing range about 240 miles from Los Alamos. Oppenheimer named the site Trinity, inspired by John Donne's poetry, Batter My Heart, Three-Personed God. Elsie McMillan asked her husband Ed what to expect. Things were moving fast now. There soon would be a test near Alamogordo at White Sands the very place we had visited with carefree abandon a few years ago. I asked Ed in all innocence what would happen. It seemed an easy question with a simple answer. Knowing that it was an atomic bomb they were testing should have made me more aware of what would be involved. It was difficult for Ed to tell me. He finally answered, there will be about 50 of us present, key workers. We ourselves are not absolutely certain what will happen. In spite of calculations, we are going into the unknown. We know that there are three possibilities. One, that we will all be blown to bits if it is more powerful than we expect. If this happens, you and the world will be immediately told. Two, it may be a complete dud. If this happens, you will also be told. Third, 
it may, as we hope, be a success. We pray without loss of any lives. In this case, there will be a broadcast to the world with a plausible explanation for the noise and the tremendous flash of light which will appear in the sky. With our alarm set for 2.30 a.m., Ed would leave at 3.15. We did not want to allow much time. We did not want to say goodbye. World War II was an immense war. Over 61 million people died during the war, all across the world. It was a world war. And the United States was building two atomic weapons to use to end it. The thought was that it might be possible to use them in Europe and to defeat the Nazis. But the Nazis actually were defeated before the bombs were ready. So the bombs became available to end the war with Japan. During this time, in the Pacific area, the United States was fighting an intense battle with the Japanese. We were slowly taking the islands out in the Pacific. And so we did take an island known as Tinian, where we staged the bombing raid on Japan for these atomic weapons. Now, the atomic weapons fit into the American bombing campaign, and we were bombing Japan with fire bombs and burning their cities down in an attempt to take away their capability to fight, but they would not give up. So the United States used the two atomic weapons on two towns, two cities in Japan, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those are the only two places where an atomic weapon has been deployed in wartime. And those cities were destroyed. Many were killed, thousands, and then thousands were exposed after that fact to radiation and sickness and death. The war, however, was ended, and quickly. World War II ended in the fall of 1945 with the American use of the atomic weapons. The Japanese emperor came forward and overruled his war council and uh, suspended the war and essentially it was over. At that time, the United States felt like the use of the atomic weapons made a show for the Russians, for the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was an ally of the United States during World War II, yet we did not want to share the secret of how to create an atomic weapon with them. Only four years later, the Russians, under the Soviet Union and Stalin, successfully tested an atomic bomb of their own. This caused the United States to move forward into a crash program to build additional weapons, and that started the Cold War. The Cold War was an intense time for our world. Although it didn't result in an atomic exchange, we came close several times. And we built an immense arsenal. Many countries did principally the United States and the Soviet Union. We went from having two bombs to thousands during the 1960s and 70s. This museum has the largest collection of those materials that are unclassified that people can understand and look at. And here in this gallery, many of them are found. During this time, you heard about things like duck and cover, civil defense, and the uh, sense that the United States would be able to do first strike. Other things that were discussed were MAD. That's not being angry. MAD stood for Mutually Assured Destruction. This was a doctrine of our government that would essentially annihilate many people who were citizens. Millions could die if there had been an exchange. There was a thing that was created called the Triad. The Triad was a defense attempt using submarines and hardened silo-mounted missiles and bomber-dropped atomic weapons in an attempt to make it impossible for the Soviet Union to survive a second strike. And we did not have a hot war or World War III during the Cold War. The Cold War ended 
in the 1990s, the early 90s, as the Soviet Union and communism in that area collapsed. Though today, the world is still not a safe place. Atomic weapons are still out there. So that was a brief uh, little history or a little touch on a couple of the things that we have here at the museum talking about nuclear history. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of Nuclear Science Week Virtual. Have a great week and don't forget to wash your hands.